Thank you, Naren. Uh, thank you so much, Naren, for inviting me. In fact, the, my, my talk is mainly dedicated to understanding how fluid mechanics helps us to understand uh, hydrocephalus and uh, these complex cases. And you will see during the presentation that my presentation is clearly in connection with Dr. Krishna Smuthi's presentation, since we're dealing with flux within the brain. First, my, my conflict of interest. And when you face patients like this with dilated ventricles, the big problem is that we have to sort out. Um, uh, and the big problem is how can you go through uh, this, this clinical problem and uh, sort out the clinical question whether this patient has to be operated or not. And my will is to help you to understand what is underneath. In fact, what are the mechanisms and the fluid mechanical properties that ultimately need, lead to a condition uh, called hydrocephalus? Let's start from the very beginning. I always quote this wonderful paper from Salomon Hakim, which is really, uh, for me, a, uh, an important milestone, a very significant milestone on the history of hydrocephalus. Because uh, Salman Hakim was able to describe a condition that uh, was related to uh, um, um, uh, a problem, a clinical problems related to normal CSF pr um, pressure and uh, altered uh, fluid hydrodynamics. And since very this very first presentation, it was a clear link between clinical problem, the concept of NPH and fluid dynamics. And I, I always try to uh, counsel, so to explain, because when he was facing those two conditions and patient with dilated ventricles, uh, Salomon Hacking was always referring to the relation to hydrodynamics in order to understand what are the link and how can we characterize the physical property, properties involved in this condition. And we all know these ver very, elegant graphs uh, explaining the connection between clinical problem and free mechanics issue. And you see that when he was uh, describing his, his concept, even in the famous stamp from Colombia, um, each time a very strong emphasis was put on free dynamics in order to characterize how fluid is going on. But let's start with a very simple definition because we have to clarify the word we use. What is a solid? A solid is a material with definite volume and fixed shape that resists under constant load. A fluid is also a material with definite volume, but no fixed shape that deforms under a load. And this is very important to differentiate those two. Physics is uh, the study of properties of matters and energy. Mechanics studies energy and forces. Fluid mechanics studies fluid in motion and at rest, and poro mechanics in connection to the all above mentioned concepts is a branch of mechanics that studies behavior of a fluid saturated porous media. And I would really like to uh, emphasize this concept because obviously when we deal with brain, with, we are dealing with a viscoporelastic media saturated with fluid. And in that way, four mechanics principles and laws should also be applied to the brain. And the issue is that most of the time when we look at those conditions, they're mainly de defined as a condition. If you look at this very simple exp ex experiment, I have to redo it one more time. Drop a, a sugar in a cup of coffee, and then uh, slowly the sugar disappears because of diffusion. And that was exactly what the, Dr. Krishna Smutis was describing, whether the molecules and their, um, their, their ability to um, uh, change the, the, um, the, the concentration of a, of a material. But if we deal with the bulk flow advection, this is mainly what we're facing at when we operate on the patient. We don't deal with diffusion, in fact. We deal with advection. And advection here is the spool. Then it's very important for a clinician to differentiate diffusion and advection. We are dealing with bulk flow, mainly on our clinical uh, routine. And we have to understand the link between what we face and my presentation was mainly dedicated to advection, bulk flow, 
in comparison to the previous very nice lecture about diffusion and molecule concentration. Uh, the brain as, as a structure then, uh, if we address this as a material uh, defined by roots, physical roots, and there are in fact two separate concepts or bodies within the brain. The first is the fluid brain. Fluid brain means flow uh, either by diffusion or by advection flowing within the brain parenchyma ventricles. And on the other hand, got a solid brain that uh, represented here like a concrete. It means there's a stuff which has a sort of strength. And we have to assume that in the brain, we combine solid and fluid. But of course, this is not like this very simple picture. It's more or less like this, or more precisely like that. And if we assume that these small grains represent part of the brain and fluid go is going through this, if you assume that it is, for example, sand, that the, the, the permeability, the way the fluid is flowing through this material is depending on the porosity. And then we can go back to um, physics. And we learned from physics of sand, for example, that permeability and porosity are correlated. And the higher the porosity, the higher the permeability. Don't forget that permeability is one divided by resistance, means that the inverse of the resistance. The more permeable, less the less resistant. But from this on, if we assume that uh, this is what we deal with, we're dealing mainly, as I mentioned previously, with bulk flow. And bulk flow is well known. This is what we learn and what we teach when we explain fluid inside the brain. Uh, the fluid is produced by chloric plexuses and flows through various cavities towards the peripheral of the brain and is drained uh, towards the venous system. And this bulk flow is well characterized. And this is what we face in our daily life as neurosurgeon when we deal with patients. And it is important to understand also what is underneath and what is the relation between fluid flow and mass transport. I would like to emphasize something which is significant for me. When we deal with fluid flow and mass transport, you're not dealing with volume. For example, an MRI um, describes an image, describes a volume, but a volume has no mass. And we have to be aware that we have also to deal with mass transport within the brain. And this very good paper refers to what Dr. Christian Mutis showed very nicely previously that there are a lot of interstitial solutes that flow within the brain and sort of um, behave as a material or, or uh, um, uh, a parameter that can damage, damage sorry, the, the, the brain and also clear, create a link between free problem and uh, and large ventricles. But one more time, don't forget that we are mainly dealing here with diffusion rather to, to bulk flow. And this concept of connecting and uh, slow movement has been really um, promoted by Nedegaard about uh, 10 years ago with his famous concept of lymphatic. And roughly, uh, they, they claim that um, uh, CSF is a garbage track for the brain, or fluid is a garbage track. It means that uh, the fluid is flowing through the brain with convection, that's clearly here, convection, it means convec advection, bulk flow is same, it means that fluid flowing against a great enough pressure and getting rid of wastes uh, that, uh, that the, and the, the wastes are um, uh, evacuated uh, downstream. And this uh, is an away question nowadays, especially with very nice uh, conceptual and experimental work, analyze whether uh, bulk flow was prominent in comparison to, to diffusion. They clearly say that from the mathematical point of view, when we deal with uh, uh, blood brain samples, and when you characterize the flow within this, this sample, you clearly see that diffusion is prominent at that scale. Exactly what very nicely Dr. Christian Smutis showed previously. And then nowadays, this very recent good review clearly states that at present, 
Neither the lymphatic hypothesis nor any clear hypothesis can explain or resume how flow and solids move into, through, and out of brain parenchyma. It means there's a lot of things to explore further in order to understand. But go back, going back to clinics, we all know this famous paper from Harry Cade, uh, pay a huge, huge tribute to him. And from his concept, he was only looking at where is the point of obstruction. And from his paper, we all know that roughly there are three points of obstruction, uh, the aqueduct, the subject space, and granulation, roughly. And if the stenosis is the part of obstruction is prominent in, on the, in the aqueduct, it sounds like logical to perform an ETV. But if uh, it's mainly peripheral, either in submarine space or in granulation, it sounds logical to perform a VP or a VA shunt. Then depending on the alteration of the bulk flow along ventricles, we should be able to characterize and define how to optimize and tailor the treatment uh, for every patient. That's why we need, in fact, metrics. We need a um, manometer. We need a system to characterize. We need, on the one hand, the CSF. On the other hand, got reference value. Reference value is supposed to be the atmospheric pressure and the venous pressure. But if you measure, for example, through an OMAYA and frontal reservoir, you can clearly address the, the resistance at the level of the aqueduct. If you do it lumpily, like doing on a regular basis, you're more you're able to explore the resistance which is downstream then it is very interesting to gain access to ventricular CSF in order to characterize what happened from here down to the reference point down here, down the flow. And this is, I think, very important in order to be able to clearly say what can we say, how can we explain what, uh, what is the origin and how can we deal with this condition. Then to step further, to step further, Going back to Mamaru's concept, he described in the 70s this concept that now I think we have to refine and not at all able to, to criticize. Or to, but I propose to add this. It means that within the framework of Mamaru's approach, there are in fact two resistances. The first is in the broad sense sub subdirectory space and granulation, and the other is intraventricular. And at the same time, in the mathematical formula, we have on the one hand side in series, resistance to in, in the subregion space and the resistance in uh, uh, intraventricular. Then uh, one more time, this is the patient. This is more or less the principle we were looking at. Let's go further. This very good, very good paper from Giorgio uh, clearly explained the gray zone from adult uh, hydrocephalus. Uh, and the, the cubers are really interesting. Uh, Combining lower, long time, long, long standing overage ventricular megaline in adults, late onset also, uh, idiopathic axial stenosis, normal pressure hydrocephalus, differential diagnosis, and would say at the very end, conundrum. In fact, it is very difficult when we face in a clinical patient to decide what is actually driving his or her condition. Is it fluid problem? Is it, um, psychological problem? Is it, uh, a neurological disease? Is it, something else, and this is why we have to conceptualize. We have to understand how to optimize this treatment. This very good uh, systematic review of, of also clearly showed that the complication rate of the treatment of LOVA is, is lower in ETV, but um, the success rate is rather similar between comparing ETV and uh, VP or VA shunt. And when we face this condition, even with patent aqueduct, how can we deal with those patients? How can we sort of try to sort out? From my perspective, I'm, I am very much um, interested in, in fluid dynamics, as you mentioned. Why? Because it's, first of all, fascinating. And second, as a clinician, it is very useful to answer at bedside an important question. Is the bulk flow no more? Yes or no in patient. And I'm going to show you three examples how to deal with. This is my daily life. Those two patients do look the same, but the CSF profile is completely different. This one has, has a low resistance to CSF alpha, high permeability. It means that mainly vascular, um, not that much probability to improve its condition after shunting. This one is completely different. You see the very high 
a steep increase in, in, in pressure demonstrated a low probability, high resistance, that this is obviously a fluid problem. And the, the probability of improvement is significant. Based on this, uh, I'm using this on a daily basis. And I'm going to show you two important papers. The first is a, a paper from, from uh, Kostnivillius and team, and they measured um, air out intraventricularly and uh, in the sovereign space. And the conclusion are a bit confusing because they clearly say that air out intraventricularly and in the sovereign space did not pre predict outcome, but the reduction in air out was correlated with clinical improvement. And at the same time, preoperative elastance correlate, correlates uh, positively with clinical improvement, but elastance was unchanged. And in a way, it is a conundrum. These, uh, th they also show a very nice, interesting graph. When we co they compare uh, air out intraventricularly, measured in the intraventricularly with the Noma reservoir, and air out measured in the subring space with the lambda picture, lambda needle. You see clearly that if you draw a line of that, that, that um, uh, separates those two, you clearly see this patient, for example, with a high resistance intramedically, but uh, resistance to, to uh, CSF outflow was much lower. It means that aqueductus stenosis was very, sorry, uh, very probably significant. And those patients are and sub upside down. And one more time, drawing a conclusion when we face numbers, when you have met, uh, proper metrology is very useful. And uh, that's why an, uh, an interesting um, um, project is running. Um, Alessandro Pirina and, and Romain and, and, and Giorgio published a very good paper also, and they characterized TSA dynamics uh, through uh, LP. And they also uh, they have been able to demonstrate that they can characterize those two conditions nicely. But uh, when we try to clearly define a threshold, it's difficult. Then I think um, the very best way to approach is to show you a few examples of my daily practice. And from this on, I'm going to show you conditions, CSA dynamics, and try to explain uh, how useful it is and how complex it is. That's why it is so fascinating. The first case is an uh, is a rather old case, I would say. It was um, a young lady. I saw her. Um, she had a C-section, and she became probably, probably you know, slowly to become depressive, and she had a rather high frequency tremor. Frequency was slightly above what was known in Parkinson, and she had walking difficulties, she had incontinence, and on the MRI, she ends up with large dilated ventricles. And uh, the fourth ventricle was clearly reduced with no flow. Then I could do I can do two things. Either I say, okay, you have clinical signs, uh, aqueductal stenosis, let's go on ETV, or let's try to rationalize, measure things, and make the decision based on facts. Then I decided to insert on my reservoir and do and did the infusion study. This is a profile. You see, this is baseline ICP, and ICP is going slightly up and stabilizes. This is the analysis uh, with the uh, ICM plus. We see that baseline ICP is rather low. Plateau is on the um, normal range. Resistance also low. For my perspective, this CSF profile is normal, and I was surprised because it was my early experience. I sent this recording to Mark Chosnika, and he agreed that it was not at all and abnormal, and he did not recommend to perform an ETV. Then I, I did, did not operate on this woman. And um, I saw her three months' time in my clinic, and surprisingly, she told me that she improved after the Omaya Reservoir. I said, but I didn't do anything. I didn't treat it. I didn't properly treat it, your, your disease. But she told me, yes, but I, I feel better. I quit my, my antidepressive uh, pills and after a while, in fact, as time goes on, it actually gets worse. And we ultimately had the clue, and she had a that scan that demonstrates clearly that she had a moderate stressful and severe pot potaminol 
Dominic denervation. Then obviously this woman was in a condition related to neurological disease and not only, and now she's treated as a Parkinson disease, not actually as a hydrocephalus problem. Then this is important because this case clearly shows this conundrum, the fascinating conundrum, bridging movement disorders and adult hydrocephalus, irrespective of the type of hydrocephalus. And we have always to pay a lot of attention in order to properly characterize the, 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 those conditions and define whether it is worth or not treating. And uh, this initiative from the, the, the Parkinson and Movement Disorder Study is really useful for our community to pay attention that hydrocephalus is also a movement disorder problem. And since we know this, that there is a lot of um, sort of overlapping, we have to very carefully pay attention that hydrocephalus as a free problem condition, hydrocephalus is an imbalance between inflow and outflow with uh, modification of the volumetric of ventricles and leading to condition. But we have to also be aware that there are other mechanisms like Parkinson or other condition that leads to. And we have to always to keep in mind that hydrocephalus is a syndrome, but it has a persistent degree of uncertainty and instability. And facing this, if you accept that there is a persist, persistent degree of uncertainty and instability, then you need to rationalize, to bring metrics, to bring values, and in order to say, am I right to proceed further in shunting a patient, or should I be more cautious not to go further? The second case is an interesting case. A guy in meningitis, meningitis in childhood, walking instabilities, and you see they got a large cyst in the posterior fossa. And uh, you see dilated ventricle, then this guy, I decided to, of first, I wanted to understand what was his condition and whether CSF profile was normal. And you clearly see that when you inject fluid, pressure is going really quickly high and resistance CSF outflow is clearly increased. There is an obvious alteration. And don't remember the whole Ricky's um, graph. It means we're measuring at the level of ventricle. We know that the, all the resistance, which are in series, they are not in parallel, they're in series. The, the sum of the resistance demonstrates a sort of yield this increase in pressure. Then I decided, of course, to perform an ETV. I did the ETV, and this guy was a little bit improved. The, 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 the MRI, the post off MRI shows clearly the void, and uh, we clearly that uh, the ETV was, was significant. But when I did, when I checked uh, whether I had any improvement, in fact, resistance was similar. And there was no clear benefit. Then, although a patent ETV, the fluid mechanics within his, his brain was not at all improved. And this guy didn't want to go further. And I, I, I saw him many times. And uh, the last time I saw it was in 19, 2019. And you clearly see that this time there was a little bit improved uh, or getting worse. And there is a post posterior posterior for, for, for displacement. And since it was getting worse, I inserted in a, a VP shunt and then he improved. Although his condition is really stable, clearly he went, it, it was improved after um, a VP shunt since we demonstrate that there was an, obviously a problem in the, in the subdirector sub and granulation system. The third case is um, a young guy, very active, very sportive, and uh, he developed papilledema with clearly dilated ventricles, aqueductal stenosis. He didn't want to have an omaya, just stick a needle in the back of the face of his, of, his, of, his chair, of his lung, and you clearly see that ICP at baseline is increased. Then I decided to perform an MRI, uh, an ETV, and the ETV was patent and really quickly and dramatically improved after the ETV. But an interesting thing in that if you have a look to this venous system, this is prior, and this is after the ETV, you clearly see that uh, there was a dilation. It means that this patient has obviously fluid problems plus venous problem. And sorting out the fluid problems also improve uh, his venous condition that 
in a way also improve uh, CSF outflow. And this is known for a long time. And after to, to a huge tribute to Pierre Jani, which was a mentor of the, my previous hospital. He died unfortunately when I arrived in Clermont-Ferrand, but he was really leading. And you see his uh, a picture of a uh, Nifurian study he was doing in the 60s in, in Clever with this uh, machine, which looks like it from uh, old old fashioned systems. But uh, interestingly, at that time, they were always uh, measuring ventricular pressure and the uh, sinusal uh, pressure, the sticky needle in the in the in the sinus to compare and to explore, and this is very interesting to and to to conceive that at that time, when they wanted to understand, they had to measure the hemodynamics and hydrodynamics in order to characterize a condition and, as indicated by by Solomon Hakim, characterize fluid mechanics, physics, mathematics, and ultimately take a good decision. And interestingly, if you look at the, the original stem from Colombia, you clearly see that the dilated ventricles, you see that there is a narrowing and the system, vascular system is altered. And when you treat hydrocephalus, you clearly see that vessel dilate. In the original stem, uh, there is a clearly an improvement which the, 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 the detected. The fourth case uh, is, um, is a guy with a dysgenesis of the third ventricle, complex cases, then I decided to put an OIR reservoir, and you clearly see that ICP is soaring very quickly, resistance very high, and I did also the same on the Lambert fecal, and you see that the profile is very similar, meaning that obviously the problem is not only on the aqueductus stenosis, it's also more peripheral. Unfortunately, the, 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 uh, this guy has been, I inserted a, a VP shot, but unfortunately died for another uh, for, for hepatologic reasons, and uh, but it was uh, in a way improved after after the shunt. Last case is a very recent one, uh, a rather young lady. She's working. You see clearly this very huge uh, dilation of the ventricles, and in in 2014 she was unstable. Then uh, I inserted an omaya. Um, in fact, you clearly see that the pressure is going too high and resistance in the upper. Uh, upper threshold, then I decided to, to perform an ETV, which is patent. Uh, she improved a bit, but not that much. And then she went back to me, said, I don't feel that good, and I checked. And this time, uh, CSF profile was improved, with this time resistant in normal range. And I saw her in 2018. MRI was fine, uh, ETV was patent, and the uh, ventricle was still dilated. She was not that good. Then I decided to check the CSA dynamics. Similar, no change. I say, I don't do anything else. And recently I saw her for various reasons. She's very anxious. She's working. She has got difficulty to be, to be maintained at, at work. And uh, she, she was unstable. And uh, was last, last week I did this infusion study. And you clearly see that CSF is also normal. Then overall, uh, you see that. Uh, when we deal with those conditions, uh, we have to be aware that hydrocephalus, lover, are mainly syndromic approach. We have to be very aware of this and use as far as we can to characterize and uh, to pay a huge respect to the, the giants we are following. Uh, and uh, I, unfortunately, due to the reduced time, I have uh, roughly 50 patients I will be able to give more details probably in, in Nagoya because I, I, I'm very interested in, in extracting the data and give more precise results instead of case series. But uh, understanding and measuring is very useful for a clinical practice, also from the conceptual approach, but also for the very practical approach. To say to this lady, last week I told her, your CSF profile is normal. Don't expect uh, anything new from me. You're unstable. Yes, I know you're a bit depressed. Yes, I know. But I'm not going to operate on because I have facts that uh, that can be criticized, of course, but facts that show normal profile. And this is very useful for those complex conditions like like Lola. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Schmidt. That's a fascinating and uh, very um a scientific talk in the sense I'll that come to, yeah 
Oh, can you hear me? Uh, in the sense that um, you know, when we talk about hydrocephalus, it is um, it is a, a dynamic process. It's about flow and volume, and and then we usually try to judge things by imaging. Um, can I uh, once again, if, if for the participants, if you have any questions, could you please put them on the chat box, and I will pull you up. Um, but in the meantime, can I once again uh, go to our discussions first? We have got, um, uh, thankfully, Dr. Adrian Caceres has kindly joined us just after reaching Chile. Uh, thank you, Dr. Caceres. So shall I start with Dr. George Jallo again? George, thanks. Uh, hey, uh, thanks, Naren. And, and Dr. Schmidt, that was an excellent presentation. Just a couple of comments. Um, you know, one, um, when you do place the Amaya reservoir, how long do you monitor uh, these individual cases? Roughly, for, we think you have, it depends on whether you want to have a baseline value or you have to dynamic test. Dynamic test is painless. It, tells, it takes usually 10 minutes. Then altogether, you stick the needle and you get the answer within 15 minutes, one five. It's very and quick then, process. And then, you know, it, 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 sound, it appears that you're doing a lot of ETV. E, your, your procedure of choice is in the ETV um, in these. Yes, as, as most, if I demonstrate that there is an obstruction, I start with an ETV. And uh, if, if I, because I, have, I, I don't have enough, enough time to show other cases, but I clearly show that once the ETV has been performed, you clearly see patients that do improve and CSF uh, is improved and uh, CSF alt, uh, is, is sufficiently resistant, is, is lower. But uh, the, the very important thing is to combine the, the complexity as a clinician know how difficult it is to clarify things. But when you have solid facts that show that CSF profile is normalized, it helps to say your CSF is normal then you got sort of migraine, you got complex headaches, and don't worry, the pressure inside your head is normal. It helps a lot. And this, for me, is very useful to characterize and give a clear answer to the patient. I don't know whether, George, I, I answer properly your question. No, you did. Um, the question, the follow-up is, do you routinely follow, uh, re-monitor the patients after an ETV, and at what time period, or do you only do it if they fail to improve? It's, it's risky to do it properly because even if you're very cautious, there is a risk of infection. And I'll always do it when the patient gets worse. But frankly speaking, when you deal with patients with lava, most of the time, as time goes on, they get worse. And then since they got worse, it is very important to say at a certain time, is the CSF profile normal? That helps a lot because what we can do as a surgeon is to, we, we are sort of brief, ex, highly performing uh, uh, fluid engineers that saw that plumb, plumbing problem and to uh, performing an ETV or a VP shunt or whatsoever pro procedure. It is, it is very useful, but we have to demonstrate that there is a metrological problem in those patients. We have to measure things and compare before and after. I know it's not very trendy in the community, but it is very useful to make the good decision and to do the follow-up. Thank you so much. That was very helpful. Yeah, thank you, George. Thank you, George. Um, that's great. And um, Dr. Caceres, Adrian, um, do you have any questions? Hello. Pediatric can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. So excellent presentation, Dr. Schmidt. Um, it, it's just a comment and, and a question. Mm -hmm. So I have always been very interested in the physics of hydrocephalus. And, you know, um, I think underlining the very important uh, role that the lymphatic system plays, not only in childhood, but at both ends of life, is fundamental. Um, since Michael Eknor started to propose that resonance was very important in the movement of ESF, if you know, they had this experiment where they actually uh, removed one cord plexus, and they found out that the only ventricle that would dilate would be the one that still had the cord plexus when they induced hydrocephalus. So there is more than it's uh, evident to the eye. Now, I have always wondered 
because you know some of these patients with long over hydrocephalus may have some evidence of uh, obstruction either at the aqueduct or the outlet of the fourth ventricle. But what is your take on those patients who actually have all these outlets open and we perform an ETV and they do actually improve? So what would be the physical or the mechanical explanation for these subset of patients that, you know, one would say that the space are communicated and now we open a, a, two extra holes, one in the cortex because, you know, the endoscope is going to the cortex and one uh, into the system. Um, have you uh, proposed any mechanisms for the improvement of these patients? You're perfectly right. I'm going to answer to you two points. First is the positivity. I did not enter in this topic because uh, obviously positivity is a is a for me something which is slightly separate. It's very useful, but the positivity is mainly driven by by the vascular bed, by the the elastance of the compliance of the of the tissue properties. You can see clearly seeing PCMRIs is very nice and doing PCMRIs of course, but what we're dealing with is not the only the positivity. Is also the bulk flow, slow process. And positivity is a high frequency a process, and bulk flow is much slower. And uh, Mike did very nice presentation. He showed that bulk flow was a very slow process, and at the same time, we have the dynamic. They combine tools. And uh, even this very extremely simple presentation, as the, the, the one I did, in reality, is much more complex. That's why I want to simplify things in order to make a decision. That's why we have to bridge uh, what is the link between positivity and the ring between blood bulk flow. And from this on, uh, as, as a clinician, and since I can, uh, when I do an ETV, when I put a VP shunt or a shunt, I, I improve the bulk flow of the patient. I'm not aiming at changing the positivity. But by the way, we know that it changes. We know that it changes, but it is not direct, it's probably indirect. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, sorry, I would just... Uh, Dr. Shemit, uh, can you unmute uh, yourself? Can, ah, sorry. Yeah. sorry. Uh, and, and a second uh, point to mention, which is very important. Uh, in other way, words, uh, why, when we do an ETV, why do we improve the patient's condition? This is what you, you, the question you addressed, Adrian. And I have one hypothesis which I'm going to try to validate. It's complex, but I'm, the, con the concept is the concept of neuromodulation. Roughly, when you put a shunt, when you put an ETV, uh, you change the mechanics within the brain because fluid was altered and uh, uh, since we know that there is an intrinsic biosensitivity of brain stem, especially the astrocytes are biosensitive, very probably when you rebalance the whole system, it is possible that you gain the, uh, the impact since you create a neuromodulation of the brain stem due to the physical improvement. And from my perspective, it's, it's more or less a hypothesis, but I hope I can validate this, is that when you do an ETV, when you put a shunt, you improve fluid mechanics that sort of rebalances the pressure within the brainstem and um, that uh, leads to an improvement in, in, in a clinical setting. This is not in connection with what we've, we've, we've seen previously in terms of uh, diffusion. Um, there's there's uh, the very interesting um, presentation from Dr. Christian Murphy about the, 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 the molecule, the molecular. That's why our presentation were very uh, sort of, we are looking at two different sides, and the, the reality is that we, we have to combine those two. But as a neurosurgeon, I am not able to change diffusion, but I'm able to change bulk flow and ultimately uh, the barosensitivity since we improve uh, the uh, sort of, sort of, I create a neuromodulation that ultimately uh, leads to a clinical improvement. I don't know whether my answer is, is clear enough or it's still a bit blur. Yes, Eric, I think uh, that clearly covers 
some of these uh, uh, unknown terrain. I think, you know, uh, there is a recent article published in the Journal of Neurosurgery, which is explaining how sensor imaging actually depicts how blood flow is uh, modified in patients with, you know, uh, adult long-standing hydrocephalus. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, we need to change our mindset. The yes. old physiology book, they had very simple formulas. You know, it was very useful for them to try to explain something that is really, really complex. And I think that the next step is that we need to start changing the pre-graduate way that we, you know, that we teach medical students. The old formulas are not good enough. Everybody has to start thinking outside the box. Mm -hmm. so it is, it's very evident there's more than meets the eye with this. Thank you very much. No, no, it's been a pleasure. No, you're, you're pretty right. I think what you, what you mentioned is so right. We have to think out of the box. And especially... We need, at least for me, we need science, we need mathematics, we need physics to explain, to describe. And I fully agree, uh, MRI, tensor, and imaging is very useful to characterize, but we have to aim, we understand what we're looking at. Are we looking at bulk flow? Are we looking at, at positivity, which is in a word very interesting, but refers to something different? Or are we looking at diffusion? And I'm also very sure that we can also have a look on this on this side. But as a clinician, I was more sort of describing the concept I'm using in my daily clinics. Thank you. Can I ask Dr. Satish Krishnamurti to ask your question, Dr. Krishnamurti? Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Narain. Uh, Dr. Schmidt, very nice presentation. Um, I always worry about um, symptoms of hydrocephalus before there is raised pressure. Uh, you and I know, and many people who treat patients with hydrocephalus know there are symptoms before you get raised pressure. So when you say CSF prof profile is normal and you wait for that to be abnormal to treat, what are your thoughts on um, whether, whether hydrocephalus causes symptoms before that or um, how do you recognize them and what's your treatment option for those patients? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Krishna. I think it's, you're perfectly right. We have to be aware that uh, a value, a number, is nothing but a value or a number. But at least we can treat. I uh, usually try to compare uh, with diabetes. When we're dealing with diabetes, we're measuring glucose at a certain time, and we try to define what is the optimal treatment for a long time. And, of course, I don't claim at all that this is the truth. This is not the truth. It's a fact. I just measure one thing. And from this measure, I try to conceptualize whether we can demonstrate that something is wrong, that the permeability of fluid within the brain is altered. And this can be done at bedside in every patient. And it's very useful. But one more time, and you're so right, we have to be aware that this is nothing but one value that does not at all resume the complexity of the condition. That's why I, I, I really sort of emphasize the importance of, of uncertainty and instability, that we are not only dealing with free problem, as you very nicely mentioned, that at, at, the, at the diffusion level, it was your side and very nice presentation on your side. But at the diffusion, we know that loads of things are acting. And, uh, and your, your data was really brilliant about the, the impact of, of, of treatment, medication. But this is on one side. But from the other side, as a clinician, I have to make a decision based on values, on measurement. Should I treat or not? And decide what is the probability of improvement. And using an approach, a probabilistic approach, I never say you have hydrocephalus to a patient. I always say the probability of improvement after an ETV or a VP shunt is 50, 60, 70, 80 percent. Mm -hmm. It's based on literature from Amaru's and others. And it's very useful for the daily practice. But as you very nicely and I fully agree, we have to be aware that we are looking through a tiny lens. But at least this is fact. And this is qualitative. This, this is not qualitative. This is quantitative. We measure it quantification is very important to make the appropriate decision. And uh, 
quantification uh, is like when you say uh, are you improved or not improved it's difficult i want to measure me. they can show you you can criticize and duly criticize but this is a fact and we can argue am i using the, the appropriate tool the good unit the good norm and then define how can we improve the patient and also for the patient it is very important at a certain time to say your csf is normal do not accept and they, they like this approach they say i am not going to operate on you or i knew that hydrocephalus is written on your books but your clinical signs the mri are not that sure and csf is normal don't improve after VIP, after a good withdrawal don't expect a high probability of being improved and don't expect anything from the from the shunt that's why I, i'm i'm a bit pushy i know i'm a bit uh, i'm a bit um, sort of uh, uh, sort of stringent in my my way of approaching but i like the what engineers do they characterize and from this on they can decide we need metrics to make the good decision but as you mentioned of course a metric is nothing but a metric very cool for the injury thank you so much appreciate it thank you dr thank you. can i please uh, bring in dr mcallister dr mcallister do you want to make a comment thanks Yes, first of all, I'm fascinated by this whole presentation. They've really been good. And and um, I just had a comment. Uh, Satish's question, I think, is really important about changes uh, before ICP increases. And I was just reminded that long ago, uh, Hazel Jones tediously measured ICP in hydrocephalic uh, in, in the HTX rat with uh, aqueductal stenosis and showed very clearly that there were metabolic changes, mostly in energy um, metabolites that occur well before intracranial pressure increases. The ventricles are still expanding a little bit. So you could call that hydrocephalus, but ICP has not increased. So, you know, I think it's quite possible that, that you have uh, functional metabolic uh, changes uh, that could be reflected in, in in symptoms before ICP increases. Anyway, just a thought. Thanks a lot. This yes. is great. Now, so, so, so right. You're so right. That you're pretty, um, I, I, you're, I'm hundred percent convinced like, like a spontaneously hypertensive rats have dilated ventricles. It's a very good model. And yeah. it's exactly in line what you say, we don't deal, we have to deal with inflammation with cytokines problems. And this is at the level of the cell that things do happen. And it's exactly what very nicely Dr. Krista Smoothie's uh, presentation about the interplay with diffusion and what are the molecular mo uh, volume. This, uh, this is the pathophysiology and this is a fundamental process. We have to address this through questioning through science. But as, as a clinician, Pat, we have also ultimately to make a decision that's why I'm, I'm as clinic, we're really in between. On the one hand, we have to say the patient yes or no, but at the very end, you say, am I right? A question mark. And then, but you know, for patients, it's very important to say uh, at yes, no, or I'm in the gray zone. And then if you're in the gray zone, you say to the patient, I don't actually know. And among the patients I showed you, there are patients in gray zones. But yeah. actually, as a clinician, I do my best to explain, but above all, to rationalize. And facing a patient, when you rationalize, when you explain, there is a strong rational, and we're dealing with complex problem, and we're dealing with statistical approach, they do accept it. They understand. But the very important is not to claim, because I'm, there are many patient, patients that are referred to me that that have the NETV, God say why, and... Uh, and and now uh, what what else? Then one more time, I go back to the roots. What are the clinical problems? The history, the images, CSA dynamics, and then at the very end, you draw a conclusion. Can I improve your condition at home? Yes or no? And this is for me. You know, I'm a geriatric neurosurgeon I'm on the opposite side, but we we still bond each other. And uh, at the very end, my question is: How can I improve the daily life of my patient? Through my the conceptualization of of the the profile and through science methods metrology in order to understand and since you understand 
you can step further. But as you mentioned, we need more and more biology and we need also to go deeper in understanding. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shimada. That was fascinating. And uh, I think it's like trying to figure out an elephant, as the cliche goes. Um, uh, we we have different things. And I think Dr. Adrian Caceres has uh, posted on the chat box. On the other hand, we have children with extremely high ICP and minimal cognitive changes. Fascinating topic, I think. Trying to, trying to look at it from many angles and trying to then come to a clinically relevant conclusion. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Dr. Shimada.